As a, as a student at uh, university, in fact, as a student at high school, I was a, quite a terrible student, in fact. Um, I was terrible at studying. I don't know if any of you can relate to that, but I was, I'm a master procrastinator, so I love procrastinating. I'm really good at it. When it comes to doing assignments, I'm actually pretty bad at getting them done early. I get them done, but I get them done at the last moment. And I had a great routine when I went through um, university, and I, would used to, I used to do all my research leading up to the due date, and then get all the books ready, and then come the night before the, the assignment was due, I'd start writing, and I'd just write all night, and hand it in the next day. And uh, those were the days we used to have to submit an assignment uh, at university, you couldn't do it online, and so it had to be submitted by a certain time at the university. So you, uh, nowadays it's all online. So you just submit it at midnight, which is tricky if you want to pull an all-nighter because you can't do that anymore. You've got to do it the, the night before. Uh, but anyway, I was, I, was quite a, I was quite a bad student, but I, I passed everything, got through, uh, passed all the assignments, and I used to enjoy that kind of routine. Uh, that was a while ago, and that was before I had kids. I then got married, had some kids, and discovered that that methodology, that method, did not work anymore. I couldn't pull all nighters when I've got to deal with kids, kids during the day, young children. And so I had to change the way I approach study. And I actually found when I went back to do some postgraduate study, I actually enjoyed spending more time doing the reading, doing the research, and writing over an extended period of time. I thought, oh, this is amazing. Why didn't I do this all through my university days? We're talking about studying at Bible college, do you hear? So I, I did a whole Bachelor of Theology doing assignments the night before when I could have been taking longer and uh, spending more time. Now, the, the thing about that was, I believed this small little lie that I was actually good at working under pressure, and I was good at learning and, and being able to decipher information and putting it in an assignment. Of course, that's not the whole point of doing assignments, is it? Certainly at Bible college, you know, you're studying God's Word, you're trying to learn, and, and people actually learn better when they're not under stress. But I, for some reason, I don't know where it came from, I was a terrible student at school as well, I used to study the night before a test, and that was about it. Um, but somehow I believed this lie that I was actually good at working under pressure and that was the only way I could work. Now, today we're talking about what we believe matters. And often in our life, we pick up little lies that aren't quite true, little ideas that we believe about things. And we live them out in our life. Now, for me, I believed in an idea that I was actually good at working under pressure, that last-minute assignments, that was how I worked best. And, and I believed this idea, and I lived it out in my life. And I passed everything, but not great, not, not great grades. But when it comes to the Christian faith, when it comes to living out our faith, sometimes it's easy for us to believe little ideas that aren't necessarily true about faith, or about what it means to follow Jesus, about who God is, about what He thinks about you. Now, in the 4th century uh, AD, uh, um, this man called Evagrius Ponticus wrote about the seven deadly sins before they were popular. And when it comes to believing little ideas or little lies, Evagrius, he knew this better than anyone. Now, he was, he was a person that thought, he looked at the life of Jesus, he looked at the temptation of Jesus and thought, I want to know how to battle temptation. So, like Jesus, I'm going to go out into the desert and live. And so he did. He went out into the desert. He lived as a hermit, as a recluse, pretty much his whole life. And he studied and studied the different temptations that he faced. And he used to deprive himself of cooked meals. He was uh, living very rough in the desert. All the comforts he would strip away. And what he discovered was there were eight different patterns of thoughts when it comes to uh, little lies, little temptations that he faced. Things like gluttony, lust, greed, sadness, asedia, which is like the met emoji, you know, just not feeling things, uh, anger, vainglory and pride. And these were later compiled into the seven deadly sins later on. Now, I don't think we have to go out into the desert to face these temptations. This year I've been, um, well, I, I sold my house in January and I've been living with my mother-in-law uh, in her house for most of the year. And we've just purchased the house and are renovating it. I can tell you that if you want to be tempted and face situations like that, you don't have to go to the desert, you just have to renovate your house, don't you? It's, it's, it's certainly an area of temptation that brings stress into your life. There's lots of things that bring stress in. We don't have to head down into the desert. I think life itself brings us 
enough temptations, enough ideas that uh, perhaps we can believe that aren't quite correct. But the thing about a temptation is often it starts with an idea that grows on us. And then we take that idea and we believe it and we start living it out in our life. It could be a, a lie about how we can be happy, about how we can find contentment. You see, the problem with ideas is when we believe them, we live them out. And as we live them out, they become part of us. Our brains are plasticity in that, that, in that, and they change. So as we live out things in our life, our brain actually changes to make it easy for us. Things go from conscious to subconscious, we get habits, we practice it and it changes our brain chemistry and it becomes part of us. And, and so this, this idea of, of living out things that aren't correct in our life is really important to acknowledge when it, acknowledge when it comes to our faith. We can easily live out things in our faith that are not of God. Now, when it comes to living out lies, we have to start in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve. And this is a great place to start, because in Genesis chapter 3, we see here that Adam and Eve believed a lie about what they, how they could be happy. You see, God had set them up in the garden with everything they needed. He'd given them everything. He'd given them purpose, he'd given them work, He'd given them safety, comfort, the garden was beautiful, happiness, joy, everything they could have. Yet the, the serpent comes along and questions the truth of God and proposes perhaps another version of the story that they knew, perhaps extra footage on a director's cut film, perhaps. But look what the serpent says in Genesis 3 verse 4. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you'll be like God, knowing both good and evil. So the serpent here plants an idea with Eve, a lie, that she can actually be like God, that there's something more that she didn't have, that she needed, when in fact she actually had everything she needed. Adam and Eve believed that lie, and ultimately so do we. Often our sin is a result of lies that we choose to believe about what will make us happy, and we go after that. And many of the New Testament writers actually write about this, about deception by the devil. They talk about standing firm in our faith, in the truth. Now, we're not talking about standing firm in, in, in truth like um, fire and brimstone preaching, weird stuff like the earth is flat kind of lies that we need to stand against. We're talking about everyday living, living up to the truth that you know in God's Word. Peter the Apostle puts it this way in 1 Peter 5 verse 8, stay alert, watch out for the great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. Peter here speaks to those who are perhaps suffering physical persecution, but he describes the devil as someone who prowls around us, looking for someone to devour, looking for someone that he can sell his lies to about how they can be happy, how they can find contentment apart from God, to have power or fame, to have everything you want. The, have, the devil has his own ideas on how we can get those things and they're at odds with God's plan for your life, for our life and for our world. Jesus, Jesus puts it this way in John chapter 8. He says about, about the devil, He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character for he is a liar, the father of lies. The devil is the father of lies. And all our rebellion and sin against God can be traced back to believing a lie about what it means perhaps to be content, happy, joyful, to have freedom, Everything. That's against, that goes against God's kingdom. And if you've chosen to follow Jesus, the good news is that there's actually nothing the devil can make you do to act out these ideas and lies in your life. He can perhaps present them to you, but it, there's, it, he can't force you to do it. He's not forcing you to do it. But we sometimes we do anyway, don't we? We choose those lies in our life. Perhaps the idea is, I just need to believe in myself. 
I need a good job to be happy. A relationship would solve my loneliness. I can't be happy until or unless I have this or that or that situation will be sorted. I'll just be busy for this season. Or for the procrastinators like myself, what I'm doing now is more important than what I have to do, the thing I have to do. For each of us, perhaps we have a different subtle lie that is sold to us. Something that goes to the core of who we are, that hits a spot of hurt in our life, of discontentment. Now, the thing about lies, the thing about little mistruths in our life is that probably none of us get up in the morning and think, I'm really going to build on that lie in my life, I'm really going to flesh it out and really live it. We don't go out trying to do that. But we do seek out things apart from God's kingdom. And I think we're most likely to do that when we're tired, like Jesus in the desert. He's isolated. And that's where the devil comes and tempts him. And often that's where we'll believe certainly lies about ourselves when we're alone, when we're disconnected, when we're not encouraged, when we're discontented. And that's when we're unable to discern that something's actually a lie in our life. And we sell ourselves these things as well, the ideas that the devil presents to us. And it's interesting, that's where Jesus gets tempted. He gets tempted out in the desert. It's also interesting that we just read, he gets baptised and the Spirit leads him out into the wilderness. It says in Matthew chapter 4, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. So Jesus is out there alone in the desert and he gets tempted. He gets put under stress and he gets tempted. But if we just look what happened previously, he got baptised, okay? Now what was the thing that God says to Uh, Jesus, his son, when he gets baptised. He says, this is my dearly loved son, whom I love, or who I dearly love. And what's the temptation, the the idea that the devil presents? If you are the son of God. It's like, he was just told that, but now in this place of testing, in this place of isolation, that's where the devil is trying to question his identity. And I think that's the same in all our lives. When we find our place, ourselves in places of stress, we find that the devil comes and tries to question the things we already know. The devil waits till we're most vulnerable. The devil waited till Jesus was most vulnerable, isolated by himself. But of course, unlike us, unlike me, who fails regularly, Jesus doesn't fail, does he? He passes the test. He proves that he could do what no one, no man could do, no people of God could do. Because each of those tests, Jesus quotes some scripture that is really significant from the life of Israel in their wilderness experience, where they questioned God in the wilderness after they left, uh, after they, uh, left Egypt. God frees them. They walk around in the desert for 40 years. And in the desert, they question God, they complain against God, and and Jesus quotes these scriptures. And they they reference the fact that he can do what the whole people of God, the people of Israel, couldn't do. And he can do what you and me can't do on our own, which is defeat temptation completely, living a perfect life. Now, think about your life. Think about... um, perhaps the places of uh, discontent in your life or the places of uh, where you might feel most vulnerable. Because I I would ask, like Jesus, he's gone out in the desert, he's isolated, he's tempted. I don't think any of us want to be in that situation that Jesus puts himself in. So what's the opposite of that? Well, the opposite of Jesus going out in the desert is actually being in community, being connected with those around you. Not being isolated, but being encouraged by people around you. And if you feel like you are connected in the community, perhaps you know someone who isn't connected in community, where you can actually be the source of encouragement for them in their life. But that could be, a, that could be something you need to work on yourself 
and find a life group to get connected with, find a group of people to pray with, find a group of people that you can be connected with to share life together. Because ultimately, when we're connected, when we're feeling encouraged, when people are speaking truth into our life, the devil has a really hard time trying to sell you lies. This sounds pretty basic, I I think, sometimes. But sometimes it's actually really easy to just get by without. We think, oh no, we don't need community. Oh, I'm busy this week. I don't need that. I'm in a busy season. Once I finish that season, then I'll step into community. I'll step into a life group. But ultimately, if we find ourselves in that place, then we're kind of putting ourselves in a place of vulnerability where we can actually start believing some lies and living them out in our life and finding ourselves isolated. I often talk to people who feel disconnected with church and uh, sometimes it's quite sad because you can see this cycle going on that goes around and around. They feel disconnected so they don't come to church, which makes them feel more disconnected so they're less likely to come to church and so they don't come to church, they feel disconnected. And, And there's this cycle that goes around and around. To break that, You actually need something else to come in. You need some encouragement from someone. You need someone to come alongside you and connect you. So perhaps this morning, perhaps there's someone in your life that you can bring in to community and connect them and stay connected. Now, as we think about temptations, as we think about living out small little lies in our life, there's a few things that we can do looking at what Jesus does when He's tempted. Now, He quotes Scripture And when it comes to living out uh, the truth of God's Word, Scripture is our first point of call, living out Scripture. So how does that work in in, in practice? Well, we see Jesus quoted this, and and Jesus memorised probably the whole Torah, the first five books of the Bible, growing up. I have to admit, I don't know that much Scripture. Um, But in certain situations in my life where where I battle with temptation, Scripture has become the core of who I am and and how it works is that when I'm when I'm facing temptations I can I can pull out the scripture that speaks truth into that situation so for instance um, you know as as a married man you know the the temptation to 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 believe what the world says about happiness about marriage being hard work and if it's not if it's if it's too hard you should quit you know, one of the things that uh, my pastor talked about when I got married, he said, look, you need to find a scripture that speaks about the truth of marriage because you're going to find times in your life where marriage is hard and you need the truth of scripture. And so for me, Proverbs 5 says, drink from your own well, rejoice in the wife of your youth. And for me, that's been a core scripture in my marriage that I can go to. Rejoice in the wife of your youth, drink the water from your own well. And that is the core of me, it's part of who I am, that I live out each day in my marriage. But obviously life brings along new temptations and new challenges and the challenge is to be continually uh, reading Scripture, continually praying Scripture because there is a real battle going on in your life and in my life. And I think sometimes if you've been coming to church for quite a while, you kind of get better at covering up the, the lies, you kind of get better at covering up the things that you're struggling with to appear like you're a, a better Christian. And, uh, you know, that, that's a real challenge, isn't it? To be living a life in community that's authentic with those around you. And Jesus would have nothing, uh, sorry, Satan would have nothing more than to just steal your joy, for you to be able to cover up the, the thing you're struggling with and, and, and let it rob you of your joy, yet continue to appear like you are going well in your faith, but without joy, kind of like a hollow shell. Yet, if Scripture is at the core of who we are, we can't be doing that, can we? If we're living in community, we can't be just covering up who we are. We should be filled with joy, and Scripture gives us joy as we understand God's truth in our life. The second way we can uh, battle temptation is through prayer. And, and we see Jesus out in the desert and, and praying regularly out there. Prayer is one of the things that uh, is our connection with God. When we're facing temptation, prayer is 
is one of those things that we can use to battle, um, battle Satan's temptations. Now, sometimes I hear people pray, and, 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 it, and it kind of seems a bit powerless when sometimes people pray, and they use the words, if it's God's will. And, and sometimes I hear people do pray like that. And it's actually a misquote of James chapter 4. And, and when we pray, we actually need to be praying with confidence. But James chapter 4 uh, says this, he's talking about something actually different when it comes to prayer. And he says, uh, look here, you who say, today or tomorrow, we are going to a certain town and we'll stay there for a year. We'll do business there and make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It is here a little while, then it's gone. What you ought to say is, if the man, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. Otherwise, you're boasting about your own pretentious plans and all such boasting is evil. Because the temptation sometimes when we're praying, well, if it's, if it's your will, Lord, take this thing away from me, take this temptation away from me. But that's actually not what we should be praying when it comes to temptation. We should be praying like what Jesus taught us to pray, our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. When we pray, let's pray aligning with his kingdom, with his power, with his presence, with his will for this earth as it is in heaven. And that gives our prayer power when we're praying in God's will. Paul says to the church in Philippi, he says, don't worry about anything, instead pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which is sees everything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ. When we pray, pray in God's will, because that defeats any temptation. Pray until you have peace about it as well. Don't just pray once, pray constantly until you have peace. And God gives us peace as we pray. I know in my life, sometimes I've been praying and praying for about something for quite a while, maybe a couple of days, until I finally receive some peace about that prayer. And then I can stop praying. Sometimes, I've spoken to people who, who, um, who would say they would have the gift of intercession and they would get a burden to pray for someone and, and that burden would be on their hearts and they wouldn't have peace until they prayed and prayed and prayed. It could be a couple of hours, it could be a couple of days. And all of a sudden the burden's lifted and they feel at peace about that. And they know they've actually prayed. So pray until you feel like you've prayed. And the third way, and I've mentioned this already, the third way that we can battle temptation is with community. With being connected in community. And Hebrews 10 verse 25 or 24 says this, Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another. As I said earlier, Jesus was out in the desert to be tested, where he passed the test, where he showed who he was, the Son of God, perfect. But it's in those deserts of isolation, of busyness in our life, where we can start living out small little lies, that we can start receiving lies and ideas from the devil about what it means to be happy. But when we're connected with community, we have other people speaking truth into our life. Now, I would encourage you, if, you've got one, if you haven't got one or two people in your life that actually speak truth into your life, that will challenge you. I, I would encourage you to find someone. Find someone who can speak truth into your life, who you can ask and they will give you an answer that you don't necessarily like. I would, find, I would encourage you to find one or two people who can do that because we all need someone who will challenge us about the things we think, about the decisions we make in our life. Community keeps us accountable. Because ultimately, the devil can't force you to believe any of his lies. He can sell them to you, and he's so subtle at doing that. But when we live out his lives, it steals us of our joy, it steals us of our power and our peace. So there could be some challenging things for you this morning that you need to work on. Perhaps it's reading Scripture. Perhaps you need to start developing a habit of reading Scripture in your life daily, of of not just reading it in your mind, but getting it through into your heart and start living it out, that it becomes part of who you are. Perhaps it's, it's continuing to pray 
and not giving up. Pray until you receive peace about the things in your life. Or perhaps it's, it's actually it's taking a step into community. Perhaps it's joining a life group. Perhaps it's finding one or two people that can speak into your life. Because that's some of the things that help us move forward in our faith and not keep stumbling over temptations that uh, the devil puts before us. I want to finish with this uh, scripture from Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Paul says this, he says, Stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in His eyes. And ultimately, that's what Jesus wants to, to give you, a satisfying life. 